Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone on the Zoom can hear me. Um, my name is Justin. I'm one of the neurosurgery uh, PGY1s here. And I had the opportunity to learn from you all a couple months ago. And uh, it, it truly was it, was, it was an amazing learning experience. And uh, I just wish I was able to get into the OR with you guys as well and show off my crappy not tying skills. Um, but I just wanted to take a couple minutes here and share a very interesting case that um, we shared together in the neuro ICU. I think I worked with um, George. Um, no, no, not George. Yeah, George and Sam on um, this patient here, initials TB. So this is a 30-year-old um, man with no real significant past medical history other than chronic alcoholism. He fell uh, from a tree uh, in this. Uh, he lives on an Indian Reserve. He fell 30 feet off a tree. Um, he was positive for alcohol and benzos. And he was found to have a pretty nasty right temporal epidural hematoma, bilateral subdural hematomas, and a right frontal subarach. Um, and his possible right carotid cavernous fistula. Uh, he had a variety of facial fractures as well. Uh, on exam, he was extremely agitated when he first came in, so he was immediately intubated. Uh, he was a GCS-10T, so his eyes opened to voice, intubated, and but following commands. Um, we weren't too concerned with an ophthalmic exam early on, just trying to stabilize him. Uh, but his pupils are anisocoric, right greater than left. Uh, pupils were reactive weakly bilaterally. Uh, and he had some a very impressive left kind of periorbital edema that continued to blossom during his time with us. Uh, but he was able to follow commands uh, and, and move, all his, move all his extremities. Uh, so this is just a quick uh, axial CT head, uh, a non-con bone window kind of showing this Lefort fracture on the left and then an orbital wall fracture on the right. And then here's a CT non-con. I know kind of not the gist of this talk here, but you can see that right temporal um, uh, epidural hematoma, the bil bilateral subdurals, and kind of this um, right frontal subarachnoid hemorrhage here. Okay. So pretty early on, uh, ophthalmology was engaged due to all his facial fractures, but understandably, because he was intubated, you guys couldn't get a good assessment on him, obviously. Um, but early on, your team already commented that there was no kind of uh, like extremely emergent ophthalmic um, surgery indicated. So no um, extraocular muscle entrapment, no orbital compartment syndrome or open globe. Um, so our primary concern was working up this uh, right carotid cavernous fistula because it looked kind of nasty on the uh, CTA here. You can kind of see on the right side here, the right ICA, you can already see kind of how it directly communicates with the cavernous sinus there. So we got a, a DSA on post-op day, sorry, um, hospital day one. And this is a right lateral run um, with the catheter kind of just in the uh, intracranial portion of the ICA. And you can see in the cavernous segment of the ICA, the, all this ballooning here is obviously abnormal. So you can see the right cavernous sinus filling. And you can see kind of this engorgement of the uh, superior op ophthalmic vein kind of draining into the facial vein. Um, so off the bat, we knew obviously this was a huge problem that needed to be treated. So here's a good still image, all that obviously of that early venous shunting. So Generally speaking, there are uh, uh, four different types of carotid uh, cavernous fistulas uh, called barrel classifications, type A through D. So type A is kind of a direct fistula where there's essentially a hole in the ICA. So that's type A. Type B is indirect where there's a branch off the internal carotid that is then in direct communication with the, caver um, the cavernous sinus. Type C is a connection between the ECA and the cavernous sinus, and then type D is both. So as the patient progressed, he uh, did us a favor and self-extubated um, on day four, which is actually a blessing in disguise because you know he was able to handle it and kind of communicate with us a little bit more. We had a repeat head CTA, head and neck um, a couple of days after that demonstrated this known right uh, CCF. And this is when uh, ophth uh, ophthalmology was engaged more. So 
at this point, the patient was able to interact with us a little bit more and kind of tell us uh, like his visual status. And he was completely out on the left side. Um, he can move all his extraocular um, muscles on the left side, but he couldn't see anything. And I didn't understand this at all. I, I was very confused. And when speaking with, I think, Dr. Long, who was the attending, uh, as well as Sam, uh, this was likely a traumatic optic neuropathy. So this, unfortunately, this patient fell directly on his face and likely kind of, you know, hurt that left optic nerve badly um, and uh, developed unrecoverable uh, vision loss in his left eye. And as seen in this little algorithm here, you can sometimes give steroids and see if that helps, um, which we did because the patient also had impingement of his uh, right facial nerve from a T-bone fracture. So he also had this bad facial droop. Um, but that unfortunately didn't seem to help his left eye at all. His right eye, this is like the most confusing, like our visual exams are such trash neurosurgery in general. Uh, but his right eye, he, his eye was just doing, every, it was like looking everywhere. Um, it's just, I can understand what, like what was going on in his right eye, but he can see out of it. Um, so this is in relation to his uh, this, these exam findings are due to his carotid cavernous fistula. So as we know, um, the cavernous fistula houses cranial nerves three, four, and six. Um, and when kind of chatting with Dr. Long and, and the rest of the team, um, and I spoke in depth with, uh, with Sam about this, um, we thought that those nerves were essentially irritated by the, the fistula. Um, and he essentially had a frozen globe. So, uh, cranial nerves three, four, and six were affected. Um, as we often do, uh, annoyingly to you guys is we're really concerned about his intraocular pressures, um, because obviously you can see from the DSA, his superior ophthalmic vein was super juicy. And we're afraid that, you know, it become extremely edematous and he'd lose vision in his, uh, only intact eye, his right eye. So we kind of annoyed you guys a lot to, um, to get the, uh, to help us get the IOPs. Um, and I just wish we had that little, um, little, instruments so we can just do it ourselves and not bother you guys. But eventually we ended up uh, embolizing uh, the carotid cavernous fistula. So this is kind of like the post coiling and you can see that uh, they actually throw coils into the cavernous sinus itself, which was kind of crazy for me to think about, but because you have bilateral drainage, it's generally okay. So my tenant likes to joke around. You have like, there's basically a Porsche in his in his carotid, uh, in his cavernous fistula, there's just that much metal in there and it's that expensive. Um, but you can see how it's filling much nicely now. And there's a little bit of residual, but it's kind of mostly treated. Unfortunately though, this patient kind of didn't really, even though this uh, embolization stopped further progression, uh, it didn't really help him too much. Uh, and he was recently seen by, I think Dr. Christensen uh, here at Moran to kind of just optimize his, his intact right eye. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, his left eye is still out completely. Um, but that's it. Just wanted to share this quick case with you also. Uh, thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Grand Rounds. I'm Brandon Kennedy. I'm one of the fourth year ophthalmology residents here at the Moran Eye Center. I'll be presenting today um, on the mole topic. So flipped classroom didactics, three-year um, data update of faculty and resident beliefs and practices. I have no financial disclosures. And before we get started, I know we've talked about this a couple of times. I just really got, want to give acknowledgement to kind of the individuals who laid the groundwork and had the vision for this entire kind of overhaul project of our curriculum. Um, a lot of these individuals are here in the room now or listening. So thank you. They're the ones who kind of had the vision a while ago and to kind of blow up the whole curriculum and start from scratch. And I remember when I was interviewing here, I was talking to Dr. Petty, and I thought this was really cool um, four years ago on how receptive the leadership here is to resident and faculty feedback. So it's a big part of the reason I wanted to come here. I'm thankful to be able to be involved a couple of years later. So some quick background before we get into the, some of the new data. Up until 2019, residency education previously had a curriculum where um, the lecture schedule was kind of every morning, seven to eight, um, and it was more of a passive style lecture. And then you can see here, this is just trying to display that in addition to lectures, we had a lot of other extracurricular academic activities in addition to working 60 to 80 hours 
So um, eventually there needs to be a, a release valve, you know, time for residents to study, um, have a life, possibly sleep, those things. And I think lecture in the mornings was kind of this release valve. That's kind of how all of this started. And that ultimately led to this kind of shared resident and faculty mutual dissatisfaction of resident engagement during lecture, attendance, um, retention of material, not knowing kind of what to study. And if you don't believe me, here's some of my favorite quotes I've heard from individuals, some may be here in the room right now. Um, I just usually spend my time prepping for OR during lectures. I never had time to study for lectures and, it was all, and I was always lost PG by two year. I wish I had more guidance on how to prepare for lecture material. To be honest, I just stopped going and slept instead. It's a good one. The same lecture every year. So that's kind of how all of this started. Um, so they identified these problems, you know, decreased attendance by residents, confusion on lecture topics, how to prepare, where to start. Um, not a lot of engagement or discussion amongst faculty and residents during lecture time. Or, you know, attendings are preparing a lot of time for these residents, you know, giving them great lectures and no one showing up. I can imagine how frustrating that would be. And lastly, when we surveyed residents, they were interested in learning um, different styles of you know, teaching and learning and this problem-based learning, this flipped classroom model was something that was of interest. So what was the solution? If you think back, this was, <laughs> this is a slide from Dr. Vagunta. I thought it was awesome. So the Moran created a think tank. Um, this was back in 2019. It consisted of five residents initially and four attendings. And what they wanted to do is kind of take a step back, evaluate resident and faculty experience, satisfaction, perceived efficacy of the current model of giving lectures, which is that traditional style. And we wanted to see how residents and faculty felt about this. Is there a better way? What are other programs doing? Um, what's the trend in, in GME and education? And it's really interesting. So they looked at a lot of um, theory and kind of philosophy of learning looked at um, how adults learn different than kids. Um, there's a really great book called Make It Stick that we kind of um, uh, implement a lot of ideas from. And what they found, especially for um, GME and adults, is that you need more than just your typical kind of passive learning where you're just lecturing at someone or you just tell someone to read something or watch something. You need more engagement. Adults need to know why they're learning something how to implement it, how is it going to change their everyday, and also discuss it and teach it. That's kind of the highest level of learning, teaching, and retention. So this active learning, this was kind of a new concept that they wanted to implement, and kind of at the forefront of that was this flipped classroom model, and that's kind of defined as um, any form of case-based or interactive teaching with pre-work assignments. So instead of the more traditional, you give a lecture, then you tell someone to read, um, and individuals actually doing the pre-reading before or watching a lecture before and then coming to the lecture and then doing more of an interactive discussion. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of data out there, um, especially nothing in ophthalmology. There was data on kind of other places implementing the flipped classroom model and how faculty perceived um, potential barriers. And um, also a lot of kind of research in STEM in high school and an undergraduate. Um, this was a meta-analysis of uh, 25 studies that kind of looked at percentage of students who fail in kind of the teaching styles and how to decrease that percentage. And they saw that in a more active style learning technique versus more passive, less students were failing. So all that being said, this ultimately led to a kind of reimagined flipped classroom curriculum rooted in learning objectives, pre-work assignments, interactive learning activities, and this was designed and kind of started in 2020. Um, Dr. Petty, I believe, was the one who created the acronym. I'm not sure, that's what I was told. I'm not sure if that was true. But it is MOLE, so Moran Ophthalmology Learning Experience. And it wasn't just Dr. Petty. It was all the attendings that were on that kind of think tank and, and resonance. And a lot of work went into this. If you think about taking a step back and saying, you know, we have this traditional lecture style that we've been doing for the past 40 years, but now we want to start from scratch and do something new, um, you need, you know, buy-in from every single department, um, every single attending, residents, so forth. So Dr. Simpson, Dr. Pagunta, and, and um, Dr. Patel, and Dr. Petty really put in a lot of work. And this was a, a very, very, very big project. Um, and here's kind of just a general overview of the main changes. So instead of those every morning passive lectures that were kind of repetitive, discontinuous, they cycled every year and a half, 
there was no protected time for residents and attendance was a problem. Now that we just had uh, once a week, Friday, seven to nine, flipped classroom style, subjects were now taught in integrated blocks. It was cycled every year and protected time was um, noted for residents. So, you know, they had to be there even if they had clinic or OR in the morning, um, they were excused. And here's kind of the lecture layout. Um, so we're given learning objectives for each lecture, required pre-work that's given one to two weeks in advance. Then when you come to lecture, maybe there's an interactive quiz in the beginning or some other type of interactive learning activity. Um, and then there's usually a discussion based on that, then a mini lecture. So fast forward a couple of years, that was all back in 2019, 2020. And, you know, you got to start asking yourself, is this something that's, you know, worth all the trouble? How are we measuring outcomes? Are we actually doing things better? Are residents and faculty happy? Um, and how do you assess that? And that's our favorite word here in residency is quality improvement. So that's, that's what we did. Um, and our goal was to evaluate residency and or resident and faculty experience, satisfaction, efficacy of prior traditional lectures versus this newly implemented flipped classroom um, style. We also wanted to determine if the faculty and residents had preferences on what type of pre-work, what type of active learning techniques, and how much time did residents spend now preparing for lectures, faculty preparing for lectures, and so forth. So this is kind of an, uh, an overview or a timeline. You can see that the Mole Committee was formed back in April of 2019. And prior to rolling it out in July of 2020, we sent out what we called the pre-flipped classroom surveys to both faculty and residents. It was rolled out, and then one year later, we surveyed the faculty and residents again, and then three years later, we surveyed the faculty and residents again. And we're kind of going to be focusing on this last circle here as the three-year data, and that's kind of where I got to come in and help out a little bit. So for the three-year data, we really wanted to look at resident participation, preparation, engagement, satisfaction with the new style and the new learning technique, barriers to um, kind of sustainability is this something you want to continue to do, preferences and pre-work and also preferences on active learning modalities. So our three-year data, uh, we, we surveyed faculty, we had a 74% response rate, so there's 24 faculty who participated, and a 100% response rate for residents. So first, for participation preparation, um, when we asked attendings level participation for residents over time, you can see prior to enrolling out the new flipped classroom model, so the pre, the first chart there, um, there was about equal minimal to no participation versus moderate to excellent participation. And at one year, you can see we're at kind of an all-time high uh, with moderate to excellent participation. Then at three years, still more moderate to excellent participation, but maybe a little less than the one year. And when we asked residents how much time do they spend preparing for a lecture, um, one of the ideas was instead of having every day one hour of lecture, that is, you know, now we're just having every Friday, two hours of lecture. So now residents have more time to prepare for lecture. So previously residents said that they are preparing either zero um, to 30 minutes for the passive kind of lecture, daily lectures. And now at the one year post flip classroom, residents were saying that they were preparing on average 60 to 90 minutes um, versus the three year, more than 120 minutes, kind of the, the majority of residents there. So residents are definitely, having more guidance, knowing what to prepare more, and knowing how to study a little bit more for these lectures. Then we also asked attendings, you know, how much more time are you spending making these lectures for this flipped classroom style? Because that was one of the things that we saw in our surveys that uh, attendings were kind of hesitant, and they were concerned about how much time they'd be spending uh, making these new lectures. So um, pre-flipped classroom, attendings on average were spending uh, one to two hours uh, preparing for lecture. And this did go up on average, 76% of attendings were spending more than 120 minutes at the one year mark. However, we're back to the three year mark. Now they're more familiar, more comfortable with the flipped classroom style. We're back down to one to two hours. And I think this is a really interesting slide. This is talking about kind of attendance. So attendance was a big issue with those daily lectures. And you can see here up to 38% of the time there was residents missing. However, at the one year mark on this decrease, so attending uh, attendance rates did increase for residents um, over 20%, which has been awesome. And when we asked residents what's their preference for the pre-work, you can see here's kind of an example of different pre-work requirements going down the list, and residents preferred, moderate to strongly preferred, um, either BCSE chapters with studied guidelines or specific learning objectives, 
or prior video recordings from Moran attendings. And the least favorite um, type of pre-work given to residents were just a bunch of journal articles or discussion boards online. And when we asked residents what they thought was the most effective way to do these active learning techniques during lecture, they thought case-based learning or oral board style review was the most effective way um, versus role playing they thought was the least effective active learning technique at the three year mark. And then kind of going back to just attending versus residents at each year mark, um, we asked how effective do you think the current teaching style is and learning style and attendings you can see here during the traditional classroom, they thought this was not um, as effective versus when we switched to the one year post flipped classroom, the three year flipped classroom, they thought this new flipped classroom style was much more effective for teaching. And same thing with the residents here. We asked the residents during the traditional classroom, is this an effective way to learn? And you can see here strongly, some would agree is very low versus at the one year mark and the three year mark, it's much higher. So residents do think the flipped classroom is a more effective way to learn. And here, this is kind of just a blank question. Would, which do you prefer, the flipped classroom or the traditional style? So we asked residents, would you rather have traditional lectures without a flipped classroom format? This was at the three-year mark, and still two-thirds of them said no, they'd prefer the flipped classroom. And same thing here for attendings. Which teaching format do you prefer, traditional or flipped classroom? And you can see here, similar two-thirds prefer the flipped classroom. Then kind of moving forward, we asked ourselves, you know, what other things can we look at? Um, this new MOOL curriculum, the flipped classroom, it was, it was never intended to improve academic performance on OCAPs or um, oral written boards or anything along those lines. But we've presented this quite a few times at AUPO and given guest lectures at other programs. They always ask, uh, you know, have you looked at OCAPs? Have you looked at board pass rates? So that's something I just wanted to include here. Um, so this is a scaled score report of the entire program. So PGY2 through PGY4, and this is not a percentile, this is the actual score report. And you can see prior to the implementation, 2017, 18, 2019, the scaled score report, a little bit lower. And then after, the year after implementation of the um, flipped curriculum, you can see the scaled score report did increase quite a bit. Granted, there are a lot of, you know, confounding variables you got to take into consideration, internal, external drivers and motivations of each resident and everything like that. But overall, you can see a general increase in the OCAPS performance after this implementation of the flipped classroom, which I think is pretty cool. Then next, this is kind of a busy chart, but I wanted to substratify um, based off of PGY level and also percentile instead of a scaled score report. So some data is also missing, uh, especially in the 2021, there's no PGY4 data um, in our score reports, which was uh, interesting. But overall, you can kind of see a general trend. I think the improvements are most notable in the black columns, which are the PGY3s, and potentially also the PGY4s, which is interesting. We haven't really done an in-depth analysis, but that potentially could say that this flipped classroom is benefiting the PGY3s and 4s. Uh, more in regards to academic performance on OCAPs versus PGY2s. But again, there's so many co-founding variables. I don't know if you could strongly make a, a strong argument for correlation with the flipped classroom and the OCAP performance. So the main takeaway points, flipped classroom curriculum can improve faculty and resident satisfaction, lecture participation and attendance. We saw that based off of all the data. And also at the three-year mark after the curriculum change, both residents and attendings um, do prefer this flipped classroom style. Feedback from residents and attendings, it's integral to making improvements to the curriculum. Um, the initial think tank group, the attendings, Dr. Petty, uh, Simpson, Shroud, they spent a lot of time getting this off the ground. Um, we created this kind of mole curriculum in this mole group, and we have monthly meetings um, asking for feedback. We also implemented post-lecture surveys asking for feedback. So there's a lot of work that goes into kind of making sure that this is continuing to improve that it wasn't just initially something very exciting and the, the fire is kind of dying down. Um, and then lastly, just that the flipped classroom curriculum possibly could you know, improve OCAPS performance or board pass rates, et cetera. A couple other points here before I finish up. Um, there's been a huge, huge national interest in this. This has been presented multiple times at AUPO. It's presented all around the world in regards to, or I shouldn't say world, but um, the US in regards to other programs asking us to speak and kind of um, 
give them our thoughts on GME education and, and, and residency education in this flipped classroom style. Uh, here's Dr. Hu and Dr. Patel presenting at AOPO a couple of years ago. This was me this year presenting at AOPO as well. We always get a ton of questions. Um, I usually will give my email. I'll have a ton of emails from program directors asking more about the curriculum. And we always refer to our Moran Core webpage. Um, there's a lot of great information on there. There you can see a, a young Jeff Petty, a beardless Jeff Petty, talking about how do you flip it. Um, and then Dr. Patel and Dr. Bagunta also gave a really good talk a couple of years back as well, more about kind of theory and just the background of learning and how that kind of led to this whole project. We also have a mole award. Someone say it's a Stanley Cup of Teaching Awards. So you can see our little mole award going around town. Um, we give this out every year in graduation to the best lecture, which is uh, voted on by residents and fellows. And kind of just some other notable things. So the, the Moran Ophthalmology Learning Experience isn't just this new classroom didactic model. We've also um, birthed a lot of other projects to this, this mole committee, including Taco Tuesday, Department of Roadmaps for each group, Feedback Friday, Surgical Wet Lab, Just-in-Time Cataract Lectures, and also an intern year renovation project. So lots of good things happening from this group. Um, here's a link I always you know, share whenever we present this. This will take you directly to the Moran Core page. And lastly, again, I just wanted to thank everyone who kind of started this whole project. Again, you know, I, I, can't, I kind of came in a couple of years late. Um, so all, all of the things that have happened for Mole um, are really from these individuals in this slide. And I'm just here to kind of deliver some new data, but really they're the ones who made it happen. Thank you guys for listening. Any questions? A lot of great educational psychology work showing that participation on the part of all parties tremendously enhances the experience, particularly retention. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing that, uh, you know, we've taken this long to understand that there's a much better way to do this. And uh, the actual retention for those who are listening to a lecture versus time around the lecture at the time around the lecture, trying to understand the material also it is much more valuable time than the time actually being around. Right. So if, if you look at that, you'll say, we've cut that quite dramatically, the actual amount of time uh, in, in lectures, which I'm sure some critics would say is, is a negative. But if you look at the time people are participating in learning and trying to be involved and engaged, I think that the overall results, you know, are certainly validated by the overall course. But I think there's other type of uh, metrics that could be used to show that this is a much better way for people to learn things, to be engaged, interested. But the biggest thing is to retain it, right? What good is it if you, if, I mean, I, I used to have friends who would, who would, you know, this is back in the days when you could actually take amphetamines legally and they, they would use them and study 48 hours because they hadn't done anything, but they'd forgotten it all within a week. Right. So it was a worthless exercise. You know, I'm, the one thing that's a bit daunting about this is the efficiency of conveyance of information in my mind. If you have a one hour lecture and there are, you know, 60 points you want to get across, what, what percentage of those can you still convey, would you guess, in this new model? I mean, it seems to me that there's me can't cover as much material. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it's a two hour lecture. And the thought is instead of having, you know, one hour, five days a week, Residents should be taking those extra hours and doing the pre-work. So ideally, if you have, you know, 60 main points you want to get across, if there is material out there that will help you get across the information, such as BCSC chapters, videos online, previous recorded lectures, residents should be preparing and watching that or doing that pre-work. So by the time they come to your lecture, although it's only two hours, ideally they should have some idea or understand or know roughly those 60 points and then it should just be kind of a discussion kind of um really emphasizing those and, and really making it stick instead of them seeing it for the first time so i don't exactly know what percentage but the whole idea is to come into lecture having done pre-work already kind of knowing the material roughly and then really kind of hammering it home and with a more interactive discussion during that two hour time period Erica. I thought it was interesting um, comparing the one year 
versus the three-year data? Because it looked like when it was first implemented at the one-year data, everyone was really enthusiastic mm -hmm. and really stoked about it. But then by the three-year data, people still generally liked it better than the traditional format, but maybe we're not quite as over the moon about it. Do you have any thoughts about what yeah. that feeling was about? Yeah, so I think that's really interesting data, and I agree it's very important. And that's been one of the goals is to have like a more sustainable um, approach to this. Initially, like you said, everyone's really excited. Um, we're kind of all riding that high, and the data is great at the one year. Then it kind of trickles down a little bit in the three year. So it'll be interesting to see maybe the five year data. But that's kind of the idea of meeting monthly with residents, fellows, and also getting feedback from attendings to kind of keep that spark alive. And not just to repeat that, you know, okay, now we're doing the flipped classroom style, but now every lecture is the same every year, but just flipped classroom. So I think being creative, coming up with new ideas, drawing from other individuals, I think that's something that will allow kind of to have that creative spark and to have residents still, you know, just as engaged. And that's also the idea of continuing to change the free work and interactive kind of active teaching styles. So people aren't, you know, getting burnt out or they, you know, are skipping or whatever. So I, I do think that's important and that's kind of one of the next steps. Um, and we'll be writing this up as a manuscript, but that will be a big point of discussion. You know, anytime after a big change is, is this sustainable? And, and I know you recognize this, but the other big change here is, you know, going to one 7 a.m. session a week instead of four. Mm -hmm. And no matter what else you did, I'm thinking that's going to get a lot more, you know, right. approval. Yeah. So it's going to be really hard to tease that out. Yeah. Terms. Dr. Hughes, who could I have questions on that? Uh, Dr. Hughes, are you able to meet yourself? Anyone online? Hi, yeah, just, yeah, real quick. Just, just responding to Dr. Kirsten's like, really good point. Um, Dr. Hughes also responded to this. Um, we're hoping that residents will, of course, they'll have more time to learn material, as Brennan mentioned, on their own if you outline it in the pre-work. So there's certain material that's like, um, you have learning objectives that state, like, this is all the material I expect you to know on this topic, and you can pick and choose as the attending, like, two or three uh, more high-yield topics where, that are more interactive that the residents will learn during the didactic session itself. But as adult learners, like, you say, you know, residents do look do a lot of learning on their own and understanding things on their own, but the point of the flipped classroom time period was intended to be like a, kind of that precious time when you have a really meaningful interaction between yourself as a as a faculty member and the residents that you're teaching and go interrogate their thinking process and help correct them and course correct them and things like that. So it's not just a one way uh, uh, one way um, like direction of information coming from the lecture to the residents. Um, but there has been something in the other direction that residents have expressed, especially for PGY2s, to be able to understand the material that is presented to them for the first time and that they're learning for the first time. Uh, there's been a request for some more of a traditional lecture-style introduction at the beginning of each more lecture, which we um, talked about uh, earlier this year, especially at the end of last year's um, faculty meetings that we've had. But great points, for sure. Yeah, and then Dr. Kirsten, I was just going to say, um, from my, this is the first time I was a clinical faculty um, person who did the lecture this year, and I would say mine was on uh, systemic um, systemic manifestations in the cornea and conjunctiva, as well as all the corneal dystrophies and degenerations. So <laughs> I would say that I did, I replaced the cornea dystrophy lecture with like a 10 minute kind of, uh, you know, quick quiz. And I just said, this is you know, very, very deep, kind of, kind of nitty gritty details that you just have to kind of cram on your own, but this is a review. So I would say, I think that you're cutting out like traditional lecture wise, maybe like 25 to 50%, um, but then really hammering home maybe higher yield concepts and higher order thinking, um, but then also assigning patients, or assigning patients, assigning residents, you know, this is reading material that you're going to be responsible for on your own because we just can't cover, you know, 700 pages of BCSC, even in, even in traditional lecture style. Hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, this is a picture from last week. I got to go flying and skiing in Alaska, which was very cool. Some friends who ski and fly almost didn't come back, but here we are. Um, so um, today I'll be talking about uh, neodymium, dope, yttrium, aluminum, garnet, laser posterior capsulotomy and some of the inherent risk and complications of that. Um, so overall, I think there's been a lot of discussion recently about um, how routine and easy YAG posterior capsulotomies are and um, how safe they are. And I think that is to a large extent certainly um, true, but something I've definitely learned in my residency training um, is that the selection of the right patients, um, the surgical thinking that goes into the process of selecting these patients um, and actually performing the CIAG procedure in many cases um, is where the real challenge lies. Um, so I'm just going to go over a few cases that kind of illustrate some of the more challenging presentations of YAG posterior capsulotomy um, and some of the pitfalls that might be encountered in those scenarios. Um, so we first have to sort of understand posterior capsular opacification, um, which is ultimately the target of this procedure. Um, and essentially there, um, simply speaking, it's what it is really is just proliferation of lens epithelial cells um, and posterior migration of those cells that typically reside um, on the undersurface of the anterior and equatorial um, lens capsule. Um, and there's kind of two commonly described forms of posterior capsular opacification or PCO. There's a fibrotic type and a regenerative type. The fibrotic type, which you can see on the right here, um, is characterized by differentiation of proliferating lens epithelial cells. And they actually take on a fibroblast-like phenotype um, and kind of form these myofibroblast type elements that actually have some contractile properties to them. And so they often um, wrinkle and fold the posterior capsule as well as depositing lots of extracellular matrix proteins uh, which opacify the capsule. Um, and then the second type um, is this proliferative type, um, which is characterized by formation of these Weddell or bladder cells, which are essentially just small pearls of hyperproliferative but um, very well differentiated lens epithelial cells. Um, both of these types ultimately result in visual impairment, um, and this is really what we're going after um, with the YAG posterior capsulotomy. Um, so just briefly, of course, these the, the rates of YAG performance do vary by the type of lens that you put in. The overall consensus is that um, square edge optic design and um, hydrophobic acrylic lens material selection are uh, less susceptible to PCO formation. But overall in the US, you know, we're performing about 4 million, probably more cataract surgeries every year and five years down the line about five to 20% of those surgeries or those eyes will end up with a YAG posterior capsulotomy. Um, so it really is a, a huge number of people every year. Um, and just very briefly, just going over the mechanism of action, we are using a solid state around 1000 nanometer um, laser, and it's a very short, very high power, intense pulse that's resulting in tissue ionization that yields a plasma bubble, which expands and then by um, way of an acoustic shock wave disrupts and breaks up that posterior capsular tissue um, in a manner that's essentially proportional to the laser power used. Um, so the first case here, this is a 65 year old. Um, he develops a visually significant PCO in both eyes three years after cataract surgery. His Beck's corrective vision is 2040, 2050 with a manifest refraction of nearly plano in the right eye and about minus 125 plus a quarter at 95 um, corresponding in the left eye corresponding to an intended monovision target in his non-dominant left eye and his scotopic pupil size is five millimeters. Um, so the resident on service um, ends up performing a YAG capsulotomy in both eyes using a round opening with an intended uh, capsular opening size of five millimeters. And um, this patient comes back uh, four weeks after the YAG procedure, complaining of new mild difficulty with near vision tasks. And a repeat manifest refraction shows that he is still around Plano um, in the right eye, um, but there's essentially a, around a half a diopter hyperopic shift in the left eye. 
So there's kind of some controversy that surrounds the idea of induced hyperopic shift following these YAG capsulotomies. Um, in most cases, it's probably visually insignificant and it's really more relevant for older kind of plate haptic configurations. Um, but, and some authors don't think this exists at all. Um, but with larger capsulotomies, um, there very well may be a clinically significant hyperopic shift. Um, and as early as 1999, this study by Findel et al. that uses interferometry essentially showed that YAG posterior capsulotomy does cause a small but discernible posterior shift of the optic. And sometimes that can be up to half a millimeter or more, especially in these outlying cases. And this is a really interesting study in ophthalmology in 2014. It took 68 eyes um, with PCO who underwent YAG capsulotomy, and it measured several parameters, um, namely the um, shift in spherical equivalent. And it found a small but potentially significant hyperopic shift of approximately a, di a half a diopter plus or minus half a diopter um, at one month in patients who had gotten a larger capsulotomy that group is defined as a capsulotomy size of 3.9 millimeters or greater. And these are round capsulotomies. Um, and this effect persisted out to three months. And this corresponded to a small but significantly, uh, statistically significant decrease in best corrected visual acuity. And it's also important to note that not only can the optic shift posteriorly, but in extreme cases with large capsulotomies, you can actually dislocate the optic altogether, either in the immediate periprocedural um, period, or um, you can have delayed dislocation months or even years after the procedure. Yes. The development of PCO cause any shift in the refraction? Like I, I don't believe that they looked at that. I think they, these, I don't think they looked at that. I think they got them at the time that they presented with PCO and then everything was measured thereafter. Um, so this is, um, a second case. This is a seven year old male. Um, he presents three months after getting a multifocal IOL. Um, he has some blurred vision, some positive and negative dysphotopsias while playing golf. So in some conditions, um, there's some trace PCO, but it's outside the visual axis. Um, and nevertheless, the decision was performed to, or it was, the decision was made to perform a yeah, capsulotomy on this individual. He presents one week later, his dysphotopsias are totally unchanged. Um, and he's also complaining now of a central floater in the right eye. And on DFE, one week later, we see a free floating central posterior capsular scroll um, that is noted to be in the visual axis. So the question then becomes, do we YAG this little posterior capsular scroll um, or do we just observe this? And I think the first instinct is often to re-YAG that scroll. Um, which is actually a fine approach, but it probably does induce more disruption of the anterior hyaloid membrane as the YAG target is kind of pushed further into the vitreous um, to reach the scroll. And while this is not usually a major issue, um, it should be noted that the anterior hyaloid does provide some barrier function against um, inoculation of the vitreous with um, potentially endophthalmitis causing organisms like P. acnes. And there have been many uh, case reports actually of P. acnes and ophthalmitis after routine YAG. So a tip, a better short-term approach is usually just to um, reassess after six to eight weeks and allow that floater some time to fall away. Um, and so this issue of persistent floater does bring up um, some conversation around shot pattern selection. Um, so particularly um, like what we learn here at the VA and our training is a circular pattern. Um, and we found that that actually causes the most central floater. Um, there's one study that had 83 patients and they evenly randomized them to either a hinged configuration where the flap is uh, left attached at the base versus a circular configuration. Um, and about 50% of the patients in the circular configuration have a bothersome floater um, at one month versus 36% in the hinge group um, without any difference in total energy delivery. Um, and then another comparison has been done uh, between circular and cruciate patterns um, that showed at a one month, about 20% of people in the circular group did have a bothersome floater, whereas 0% did in the cruciate pattern. And so overall selection of a cruciate pattern is most likely to reduce floater formation and yield the best visual result. 
Um, and although a majority of these floaters will simply just fall away, um, actually Dr. schmitz valkenberg has pointed out cases of the posterior capsular membrane actually becoming incarcerated in the break in the anterior vitreous face that is induced by the YAG laser. Um, and often these will not spontaneously fall away and may uh, require secondary YAG floater um, lysis if it's visually bothersome to the patient. And then, uh, of course, there's kind of an alternate scenario here. Um, it's important to understand that the, if the visual result of the multifocal IOL is not satisfactory and the IOL has to be exchanged, the procedure is technically much more challenging uh, with the most common significant complication being vitreous prolapse that uh, necessitates anterior vitrectomy. This is the third case. This is a 50 year old patient uh, who develops some bothersome PCO after a clear lens exchange in both eyes. A YAG capsulotomy is performed using a cruciate pattern in the right eye. Patient comes back a week later with new glare and starbursts around light, especially at night. Dilated examination reveals several significant YAG pits within the central visual axis. Um, and here's a representative photo of that. It was actually taken um, by Dr. Werner. Um, so while YAG pits are often not visually insignificant or while they're usually visually insignificant, especially if they are peripheral, um, there's actually a kind of a nice series here by Borkenstein um, and an experimental setup showed that as few as five defects um, in the central three millimeters of the optic, um, as might be expected when using a cruciate pattern, um, can actually decrease image quality um, through increased scatter and decreased contrast sensitivity. And this is thus the trade-off of using the cruciate approach is that you might hit that lens centrally. Um, so on that um, topic, um, I think it's interesting. We kind of go back and forth on whether to use a contact lens or not. And with regards to pitting specifically, um, it's interesting because when you're using a condensing lens, um, you're actually changing the incident angle of that laser from about 16 degrees with no contact lens to about 24 degrees with a contact lens. Um, so the cross-sectional fluence um, at any given point, either behind or in front of the capsule is actually quite a bit lower um, and actually decreases the size and um, kind of visual effect of those YAG pits. Case four, this is a 67 year old female um, who underwent um, YAG posterior capsulotomy in the left eye and she develops a superior retinal detachment approximately four months after the procedure. Um, this is something we always counsel patients on as a theoretical risk of YAG capsulotomy. Um, but when you dive into the actual data, um, there's a large uh, retrospective study by uh, Chang at all in over 400,000 eyes that found the rate of retinal detachment after YAG to be about 0.5% overall, which is less than the sometimes quoted one to 2%. Um, but there is an increased hazard ratio for young patients, especially males, patients with lattice degeneration, patients with um, diabetic retinopathy and previous PVD. And then also if there is a latency of less than three months between the cataract surgery and YAG yeah, capsulotomy. Um, and this really emphasizes the importance of performing a peripheral dilated exam. Yeah, yeah. Those eyes that are over 25 millimeters are particularly at higher risk of doing the yeah, capsulotomy. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because we don't really know exactly why um, these patients develop these RDs, but it's, you know, some people say it might be the actual energy of the laser that burst, um, but that's probably, there's probably not quite enough transmission through the vitreous. And so what they think is it's usually, especially in like a long eye, when you disrupt that anterior hyaloid face, you're actually changing those tractional vectors in the anterior vitreous between the anterior vitreous and the vitreous base. Um, and so you can see in this photo here, sometimes there'll be actually like a strand of vitreous where you can actually see there's some traction kind of heading out radially, radially towards the vitreous base. And you're actually better off to, um, yag those little vitreous strands if they look to be tensile and they're not too peripheral. Um, and then while on the topic of retinal detachments, um, this is a 75 year old patient who has a history of permanent silicone oil endotamponade for recurrent tractional RD. And they're coming in with a two line decrease in visual acuity secondary to formation of a dense PCO. 
And so again, they, um, an attempt is made to yag this posterior capsule um, and uh, results in formation of vigorous and large bubbles um, just in the anterior vitreous. Um, and this is kind of an interesting phenomenon. There's a case series essentially of six eyes um, with silicone oil um, endotamponade that were yagged. And what you see with silicone oil is that um, you get this really big, robust bubble formation that oftentimes lingers for up to several days and can cause some refractive issues in that sense. Um, but more interestingly, with that kind of anterior pressure um, from the silicone oil kind of tamponading the posterior lens capsule as well, oftentimes these capsules kind of just break up. They don't really like have that nice tensile spread that you sometimes see um, when doing this with native vitreous. And so sometimes you end up just kind of shooting holes in the capsule and it doesn't actually open. Um, and in about half of these eyes, they ended up having to go in um, and do kind of a, man, a manual posterior um, capsulotomy. Um, and then just briefly, this is a case I published in medical school, a 58 year old pseudophagic patient who had a camera inlay for presbyopia correction. Um, where they were trying to yag a PCO um, and inadvertently reflected it off the camera and burned the cornea um, and also liberated some pigment into the cornea. And although these cameras aren't in use anymore, um, we do um, occasionally see some patients with presbyopia correcting IOLs, um, such as the IC8 or the extra focus. Um, and both of these um, lenses recommend against YAG uh, for posterior cap capsulotomy in their user manuals. Um, this um, next to last case here is an 85 year old with a parent PCO um, who undergoes YAG capsulotomy to relieve the opacity, but a rush of turbid fluid is seen um, dispersing into the vitreous and anterior chamber, followed by development of some inflammation with one plus AC cell and some elevated IOP. Um, and so this is actually a case of capsular bag distension syndrome, or also known as capsular block. Um, and I've actually run into this situation in clinic where sometimes that fluid that builds up behind the lens, um, if it's more chronic, actually takes on a fibrotic form where you do have lens epithelial cells that proliferate within that fluid. And it kind of looks like a PCO if you're not looking at it obliquely with the beam. Um, and even though yagging either the the anterior and or posterior capsule is the treatment for these kind of more advanced block syndromes. Um, it's important to know that um, these patients often need to be put on an appropriate anti-inflammatory um, after the YAG to kind of um, tamp down some of that inflammation afterwards. Um, and this is the last case. It's a 77 year old male who has PCO and whitish deposits on a posterior aspect of a silicone lens implant about a year after it was put in. Um, and on dilated exam, um, we see extensive asteroid hyalosis. Yeah, capsulotomy was still performed. Um, and the patient returned three months later uh, with worsening opacity of the posterior um, lens with the outline of the prior posterior capsulotomy, essentially kind of defining that area where it was opacifying. Um, and doctors Werner and Mamelis um, published a really nice report on this phenomenon, uh, being the calcification of silicone IOLs um, in the presence of asteroid hyalosis. Um, and this is an image from their study. They looked at 16 explanted silicone lenses from various manufacturers that develop um, calcific opacification in the presence of asteroid hyalosis. In 12 of those cases, the calcification um, was partially removed by a YAG laser application. But what they found was actually that after being yagged, the density of these opacities gradually um, returned and actually increased um, kind of usually within the distribution of the yag. And the idea there is that by exposing um, the posterior lens face to uh, these asteroid bodies through an open capsule, you can actually accelerate um, the calcification of a silicone IOL. And that's actually all I have. Um, I just hope that this um, impresses upon everybody that these things are more nuanced and complicated than they always seem. Um, and I wanted to give a special thanks to Dr. Schmitz Falkenberg for um, providing me with this really awesome YAG atlas that had a lot of um, ideas for these cases in it.
Um, yeah, I definitely. had a comment. So with capsular distension syndrome, the classic thing is you'll see like a myopic shift. Yeah. With, um, after they go like a week or like one to four weeks, you'll see a myopic shift. And then if you look on the slit lamp, you'll see a big space behind the IOL. Yeah, yeah. Jordan, did you look at um, like practice patterns of prescribing anti-inflammatories after YAG? Um, yeah, they sort of, uh, you mean just like in YAG in general? Yeah. I think kind of the general consensus is that a lot of people kind of treat it like SLT um, and will do like a short course of like QIB, Ketorolac, or PRED, but that it's overall, um, it seems to not be like entirely necessary. Yeah, I've had a couple of cases, maybe like two over the last 10 years, where a patient developed CME. Yeah. After a pretty routine YAG. Um, and I just wonder if there's like a, a threshold of energy that you should be thinking about. Obviously, if I ever see turbid fluid, I put them on it, but I typically routinely don't prescribe medications. Yeah. I haven't looked into any studies that like really go too much into energy thresholds. Um, I know that like a lot of the studies, they try to keep the total energy like under under 300. I know here we try to keep it under 100 if at all possible when we're learning, but. Dr. Okay. Hand raised. Oh yeah, Dr. Mallis. Oh yeah. Yeah, can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, thanks. Um, I really want to stress when we do not want to do a YAG laser. And I think you've, you've presented the two cases where we don't want to do it. The first one is where there's a calcified IOL. And if you look carefully with a slit lamp ahead of time, you can see that the opacification is, is on the IOL and not on the capsule. And you don't know how many times we get a referral here where they did the YAG. And of course, if it's a silicone lens with asteroid hylosis, the, the, PC, the deposits of calcium even get worse. And then you have to do an IOL exchange with an open capsule, which then increases the risk of potential complications. And then, you know, the second one that you don't want to be doing a YAG laser on is if you have someone with a traditional multifocal IOL and they're having, you know, dysphotopsia type symptoms, a lot of people will say, okay, do the YAG right away and they'll get better. And, and the answer is definitely don't do the YAG. You really want to carefully question the patients and you'll find that these people who have dysphotopsias with the multifocal lenses, they'll have them immediately and you don't get PCO immediately. And once again, once you YAG that capsule, removing the IOL, exchanging the IOL just becomes more problematic. So, you know, know when to YAG and know when not to YAG. Mm -hmm.